Shadrach, Meshach, and a bad amigo. That's just the Puerto Rican version. Bad amigos? Bad amigos. Y'all, don't turn your brain off because you've heard this story a thousand times. I've heard it. You've heard it. We, many of us have heard this story. I need you to understand the progression of what's happening in Daniel. So we're going to go through it for those of you who are new and haven't been here maybe from the time we started Daniel 10 years ago, and we're in chapter 3. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, kidnapped all of the clergy, the royalty, the business leaders, the political leaders, and 10,000 of them he took. Of those 10,000, Daniel, Hananiah, and his friends, Mishael, Azariah, well, we know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abad Amigo, were taken. And they were, they were told, you must learn our ways, go to our schools. So for those of you who are worried about your kids going off to college, I just want you to know that the college that Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went to, that was crazier than any college that you might be scared of. I just want to let you know that. And they were taught the ways of Babylon. And then Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, and he said, if, if someone doesn't tell me what I dreamed and what it means, then I'm going to kill all of my wise people, of whom Daniel and his friends were counted. And God gave to Daniel the dream. He said, Here's the dream, gold head, silver arms and chest, bronze torso, iron legs, iron and clay feet, and then a rock is going to come from heaven that is not cut by a human hand and smash the kingdoms. And the dream meant that Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom was the gold head. Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom was the great part of this succession until the kingdom of God would come in the time of Jesus. And when that kingdom of God came, it would fill the world as a growing mountain. This is a book, not only about Daniel, but about the end times, about difficult things that have happened, will happen in the future. But what we need to understand is that we, like Nebuchadnezzar, are prideful people. What are we? Prideful people. Last night, I was on my laptop like a warrior. And I don't want to get into debates just because of a political view I have or don't have. I just like to be snarky. Okay? So I'm on there thinking of all the things that I could post up on the people. And then I thought, this isn't, this isn't good. I don't want to be this person. Because under my bio it says the pastor at the chapel at Fishhawk. Someone might show up the next day. But then my wife commented something. And then somebody commented attacking my wife my parenting. And I said, not today, Satan. I jumped back on my laptop. After closing it down by the mercy of God, I opened it back up. And I went on and I was going to, I was going to light this person up who was critiquing my parenting skills, saying mean things about my wife. Here's the thing. Nobody says mean things about my wife when I'm right next to her ever, ever. It happened once actually. Remember in Las Vegas, you were pregnant with Jackson? And that whole gang, the guy pinched your butt, and I almost got in a fight at the Venetian, and we got them all kicked out. So that one time, they did something near me. I wasn't with her, otherwise they wouldn't have done it. Because I'm big. But on, online, and here's what happens. Here's what happens online. Here's what happens when you get money or when you get power. See, all of these platforms, all of these aspects of life, like take money, for example, or on being online, having a social media account, it does not give you a new power or, or reveals or change who you are internally, but things like social media give you the false courage to be who you really are deep down. When you get money, it doesn't make you a better or worse person, but money can reveal the type of person that you are. When you have power, when you, get, when you rise up in an organization or in a community, it doesn't change necessarily who you are, but it reveals who you've been this whole time. And what happens right now is that Nebuchadnezzar gets the dream from Daniel, and he says, you are right, I repent, your God is the best. And then the very next story is today's story where he says, I've got a good idea. Daniel has the God of magic dream knowing, and, and I'm only the head of the statue that's gold. So then he makes a 90-foot statue, 90 foot tall, 90 foot wide of him, solid gold. 
which is him saying, I know what God said, but my image matters more. And I'm going to make everyone, everyone bow down to my image. This is chapter 3. If you're in the Bible app, don't forget you can follow along and take notes. And the scriptures are in there, and the scriptures will be up on the screen behind me. Nebuchadnezzar made an image of all gold. How much gold? All gold. He's, God said, you're the head. Nebuchadnezzar said, that's not enough for me. I want all gold. And I'm not going to read through the entire chapter. We're going to go through the key verses, but I just need you to understand the setting up. And I need you to read this on your own to, to get the full story There's something very important that we must understand. Anytime you see an image being carved in the Bible, anytime, it should take you right to Genesis chapter 1. God created them, male and female created them. In whose image? God's image. Now, the Nebuchadnezzar and the people that followed him, Cyrus and Xerxes and Artaxerxes, they called themselves the God King. So Nebuchadnezzar is saying, I am a type of God, and I want to be worshipped. Here's my image. One of the Ten Commandments is don't make any images of God, because why? He's already got one. It's, it's us. We, we are the image of God. When Jesus was getting harassed by the religious leaders, and they said, should we pay taxes? He said, whose image is on the coin? See, we are all image addicts, every single one of us. We may not We may not think we are, and it doesn't mean that you go in front of the mirror and you look at yourself every morning and say, man, am I impressed by me. What it means is that primarily the image that we bow down to is one of ourself, self-sufficiency, self-righteousness. Have you wondered why it's so easy to go lenient on yourself but to judge others so harshly for things that you have also done? The longer that you are in a church body, in a church gathering, we become professionals at this. We can put forth our image that is, that's pleasant. It's got the Christian pleasantries. But inside, there are things that are broken that we are still bowing down to. We are no different than Nebuchadnezzar other than the fact that we don't have as much money. My, my wife has been giving me a hard time, and my mom, and most people in my life because I've been calling the new house that we have. By the way, I have concrete now, you guys. I'm the proud future owner of concrete. (laughs) That's all I got, concrete and rebar. And I I was calling it initially um, Tarona Osteen Manor, okay? Because there's a pastor who makes a lot of money, more than I make. Um, You can look at what I make every year at the budget meeting, and if you want, you can give me a raise. I won't begrudge you for it. And um, so I call it it the Tarona Osteen Manor. And Amy said, don't say that. It sounds... It just sounds bad. So then I just called it fine. It's just the Tarona Manor. And then I was talking to my stepdad, and I was saying, Akka, his name's Akka Kaina Aloha. We call him Akka for short. Um, Akka, when do you think you cross from, like, middle class to upper middle class? Like, is this it? Am I doing it right now? Is this me? Um, for background, my stepdad designs houses. Like, he just design, finished designing a house for the owner of all Panera. Like, that's, so those are the houses he makes. So he's like, well, let me think. How many square foot is your house? And I tell him, dude, it's like 34,000. I don't know. And, uh, and he, uh, I told him what my square footage was. And he goes, yeah, you know, I, I think most of the houses I do, like that's how big their servants' quarters are. <laughs> and I said, well, joke's on the guys at Panera. I get away with giving my servants a quarters. It's like 12 by 12. Each kid and two kids share a room. Those are my servants. I'd be called a prison in some countries. But we... We focus on ourselves. We build these things up for ourselves. And Nebuchadnezzar, he's only different in that he has more power, more status, and more money than any of us will ever have. More than Jeff Bezos. More than Elon Musk. He's got it all, and he builds a statue, and he says, when you hear any music, any horn, any lyre, any harp, anything, you bow down to the statue or you die. You know the story. Therefore, as soon as the people, this is verse 7, therefore, as soon as the people heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, I want to play whatever that is, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music. All the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And you're thinking, I wouldn't have done it if I were there. Every single person in the entire Babylonian kingdom bowed down, except, and we don't even know where Daniel's at, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Maybe 
Maybe they thought Daniel was untouchable, the people who didn't like the Jewish wise men, because Daniel had just done this dream thing, you see. And so they're going to go after the littler guys, the ones that, that came up with Daniel, the ones that Daniel has been bringing up with him in a wake of faithfulness. And they get all mad. And here's the accusation in verse 12. There are certain Jews, Nebuchadnezzar, whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abad Amigo. These men, these men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Every time there's a golden image in the Bible, it goes bad for the people that have it. Like, let's make a golden, poof, just dead. Moses getting the Ten Commandments on the mountain, the people bored at the bottom. What should we do? He's been gone an awful long time. I got it. Let's make a golden cow. God comes down, implodes the cow, turns to dust, makes the people drink the golden, dirty dust water. Nebuchadnezzar makes this golden image. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego just say no. Not today, Nebuchadnezzar. And I, my question to ask, because here's, here's what I can do. We can go full religious moral behavior modification, and I can rile us up and say, will you stand for Christ when the world presses against you? When God says, I want you to do this and stand for me, even if everyone else is bound, I could do that. And some of us would be like, yes. Some of you military people are like, I've been waiting for this. Some of you Floridians are like, I've got a gun on me right now. And I'm just telling you that it's easy to rile up Christians. It's so easy to rile up Christians. There is a knuckleheaded pastor all over the news. I don't care what your view is either way. But there's this pastor who said, if you come into my church wearing a mask, I'm going to kick you out. I wanted to just news flash for every church goer ever. The word hypocrite, hypocritus, means mask wearer. Every one of us, when we walk into a church, is wearing a mask. We are all hypocritus. We are all wearing a mask that says, this is me, happy me. Not the me that yelled at my kids or my spouse in the car, or not the me that was like, spilling cereal and saying words that I wouldn't want to utter in front of my mother. That's not me. I'm the mask wearing Christian. We all wear a mask, whether it's a cloth one, disposable one, or the spiritual one. We're all strapping up every morning to wear a mask that we think people will like more than the real us. This is why dating is hard, young people. Dating is hard because when you date, some of you have boyfriends, right? Boyfriend? No boyfriend? My prayers have been answered. Never mind. We'll move on. <laughs> okay. We're moving on. Sorry for your loss. Okay. I didn't mean like your dad killed him. I meant, never mind. When you date, you get girls, guys, young people, single people, all the people. When you date, here's what you do. You show the person your best hand of cards. Look at how amazing I am. What do I like to do? I like to eat charcuterie boards, which is a Lunchable for grown-ups. And I like to go shopping. And I, and I, like, to, I like to play, what, what sport are you into? That's the sport I'm into. Weird. And then it's not until you get married that all of a sudden, the other cards in your deck of life start flipping over. Because you showed them your royal flush, but then all of a sudden they flip over this card and you're like, whoa, you got some dad issues. Whoa, you get angry real easy. Whoa, you don't have patience. Whoa, you aren't going to be a good parent with that type of attitude toward children. Whoa, and all of a sudden you start to see, and in marriage you start looking at all of the hands that your person has dealt. And you might think to yourself, whoa, they are jacked up. But guess what's happening from their perspective? They're looking at your decks of cards being flipped over. Whoa. And in marriage, the purpose, one of the purposes of marriage is to see someone as they are. To be naked and unashamed doesn't just mean to be physically naked. It means to be vulnerable with the person. And that's why I think it's such a precious gift that God gives us. It's the closest that we can get to as humans that God has with us where he says, I know all of you. I know every card of your life. I've walked with you through every, through every painful moment, through every failure, through every disgusting addiction or sin or brokenness. I've walked with you through every time you felt alone. I've been there and I've seen all the things that you've thought and felt. I've seen the way that you've imagined this or that. And I still sent my son to die for you. This is the good news of Christ. And as we're asking, as I'm asking you now, like, will you stand for Jesus? I'm not saying will you stand up and be, be the moral police, to be the political power. 
because they had no power here. See, in America, evangelicals, we still have a lot of political pull. These guys, there are four of them. Daniel's on this story, but at this time, there's four people in the entire kingdom that are standing for God in this fashion that we know of. Four of them. So what would compel someone, what would compel you to stand, to make that stand? Now, I'm going to get political for one second. Not political, political for me. I don't like doing politics in Jesus. I don't think they mix well. I see all this stuff going on right now about the masks. Has anyone followed the mask stuff? If you want 25 minutes of solid laughter, go on ABC Action News and read the comments from their max mask post yesterday. doesn't matter which side you're on, you'll be laughing. It is funny. It's funny stuff. That's, and here's, here's how political I'm getting. It's tied into their response. See their response? Oh, it's so good. <sighs> okay. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when he said, you better bow down or I'm going to furnace you up. I'm going to burn you. If you don't bow to me, then I burn you. Verse 16. They answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God who we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. That's a bold prayer. You're about to get chucked in a fire. But then they say this, But if not, be it known to you, O king, we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. But we... And here's what I got to say. Here's how this all ties together. You guys, everyone's going to die. I love it. I cherish it. I don't do what they did back in the 70s, although I think I should have been born then. I think that I would have been the perfect evangelist when they did what was called evangelism explosion. You knock on the door. They open it. And you say, do you know where you're going to go if you died today? And I just think it's great because it's partial threat, partial promise. See, here's what we're missing in this country. Here's what we're missing in the world. Every single one of us is going to expire at some point. It might be today from a car crash. It might be in 10 days from COVID or pneumonia. It might be in 50 years from old age. It might be some other weird accident, some other disease Sin and the brokenness that has caused this world to have pain can affect any one of us at any time. It's we're one call away, we're one moment away from being dead. These guys have the best response. The king says, I'm going to kill you if you don't bow down. And they said, God's going to deliver us. And then they asterisk, they put the little asterisk there. But if he doesn't, we're still not bowing down. Now you throw us in. And this story ends up great. You, many of you know the story. Yes, there's another one in the fire. Who's the fourth one? Jesus, yay. They didn't know that going in. They weren't like, do you think he's going to show up? I mean, I've seen some of you get scared to just share the gospel. When you say, when I say, hey, do you share the good news about Jesus? Well, no, I don't, I don't know enough of it. If you're, if you're like, I can't share the gospel of Jesus, if someone's threatening you with an oven, you're going down quick. Well, how do I get to that point? How do I get this brave? How do I get this faith filled like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when the threat was there? We're going to burn you in the furnace if you don't bow down. Somebody play the music. Jingling, ding, ding. They didn't bow down. What happens? Nebuchadnezzar in his rage said that he got so angry his face twisted. Anger can affect your physiology. And Nebuchadnezzar was so offended because his idol, the thing that he wanted people to bow down to, wasn't being bowed down to. You and I have idols. Our heart is an idol factory. It doesn't make golden statues of monkeys or Nebuchadnezzars or kings. An idol is anything that you look to, that you live for, that gives you a sense of, of worth value, significance that you should get from God instead. You can tell somebody's idol when they lose that thing or when there's a threat of them losing that thing of their life, you see their anger come out. You see their lack of patience come out. You can see that idol in your fears. If you're wondering, what is my idol? Your idol is that thing 
perhaps for you that you fear losing most. You, you dread about it. You fear it. And it's something that's outside of your control. There may be this aspect of your life where worry and anxiety just keeps falling in the same thing. Those aspects of humanity, what you worry about is pointing you to your idol. This is what you're actually bowing down to. You're bowing down to your career. You're bowing down to your promotion. You're bowing down to your marriage. You're bowing down to your children. They've all become these things that we bow down to every day, but it's not a golden statue, so we don't make any fuss about it. I joke with people all the time, mostly the sports people, when they tell me, they tell me oh, we're not going to be there this Sunday. I do this even with our children's director, Joanna. Oh, we, we have hockey this Sunday. And I say, everyone has their gods. <laughs> everyone has them. Don't I? All the time. Because I'm a pick-me-up kind of person, you see. Now, I, I don't mean that if you miss Sunday, because we are the church. Coming here or not coming here isn't going to make or break your whole existence in Christ. But doing good things, positioning yourself under the waterfall of God's grace as often as you can. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Tuesday night. Go to Taco Tuesday, Wednesday night if you're a teenager. The meet and greet is this Wednesday. You position yourself under the waterfall of God's grace, God's knowledge, so that you have more opportunity to get a sip of eternity. So I, I am joking when I say that because we all have these gods. We even bring our gods here. And we say, well, I went to church today. God loves me more. God loved you 1,000%, maximum amount of love he could ever love for you. Before you stepped foot in this building, before you said or did a right or wrong thing this morning, if you are in Christ Jesus, his love for you is 100%. You are free to fail, and you are free to succeed. There's no pressure anymore because all of the pressure was put on Christ. See, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego know this, and they say, well, God's going to save us, but he might not. But we won't bow down anyway. And what happens? He threw them in the fire. The mighty men that bound Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego tied them up and threw them in. The mighty men died because the furnace was lit seven times hotter. So the people throwing them in the fire died. Nobody even sings a song or writes a Sunday school story about that. Have you ever seen someone get burnt? My stepdad was barbecuing uh, chicken recently, and he does this thing where he, like, continues to just lather on sauce, like the whole process, and he gets this crispy shell of barbecue, char-grilled skin, but it's on such a low-medium heat for so long, the skin just turns into, like, liquid-hot magma, and he was getting the chicken and putting it on the serving dish, and he lost the piece of chicken, and it went tumbling down, and he just caught it. Bam! But it had just come off heat for like 45 minutes, molten lava, barbecue sauce, sugary, sticky. And he just like held it. And I think he looked at it. And then he put it down to reveal this massive burn, blisters and boils and skin already coming up. And now that I think about it, I think that piece of chicken stayed on the serving dish. <laughs> anyway, that was a burn from a piece of barbecued chicken, and it affected the rest of the, like, he's like, ha, ah, and he was in the ice, ha, ah, oh, ha, ah, oh, ho, oh. ho, and then Silas and I, we went around the block and stole aloe vera out of someone's front yard, um, and, uh, and we didn't steal, we borrowed it partially, okay, and, uh, and he put aloe vera for days, ah, look at this blister, 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 and I'm like, that is a piece of barbecued chicken. I don't think we understand the biblical story. We just throw it in the Sunday school bin. Ah, oh, yes, they went into the fire. Three giant, strong, strapping soldiers who threw them in also happened to die of burning death. And then they go into the fire that was lit seven times hotter. Nothing is happening to them. They're just in there standing. What are you doing if you have something like this happen, like a God-sized miracle. Like if you fell into a bonfire, and you're like, it's actually not that hot. And what would you be thinking if the next time you went to the pool, you like walked and just kept on walking on the water? Huh, weird. What are they doing in the fire? And then Nebuchadnezzar's looking at the fire, and he's thinking, I killed my soldiers to kill them. Why are they standing? What? Who's that? One, two, three. Christophany, a theophany. It's a word you should know. It's when Jesus appears before he was born in the flesh in the Old Testament. 
It happened with Jacob, and he wrestled with Jacob and broke his hip. That was Jesus, an angel of the Lord. The majority of the time that you see it is Jesus in the Bible. Anytime that God shows up in a physical form in the Old Testament, it's called a theophany, an appearance of God, or a Christophany, an appearance of Christ before he came. And this is one where I, you guys, I just can't even fathom that we teach this to our kids. It's crazy to me that we just want to teach our kids, be strong like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and all will go well with you. The majority of the time, it does not. Over the last four years, uh, tens of thousands of Christians have been getting slaughtered in Mozambique, absolutely slaughtered. You don't think they read this story? There was one village that was burnt down. It is the pastor and his wife and two kids. And the pastor escaped. They all, they all fled and ran. And they thought that they were together. They were not. The pastor went back the next day. He had lost his wife and one of his children in the midst of the scuffle. This is happening right now. Lost his family in the midst of the scuffle and the war and the skirmishes and people being kidnapped and taken. And he thought they were not going to make it. And he went back and he found his body of his four-year-old. Um, boy had been brutally murdered. Village raised to the ground in fire. When someone asked him, what are you going to do? How are you going to keep following this Christ who uh, these people are persecuting? It's a, it's a branch of Islam that is doing this to the people, the Christians of Mozambique right now in the, in the tune of tens of thousands a year. And um, he said, they, they can take my child. They can take my life. They can take my wife. But they will never be able to burn Christ out of me. And we're over here like, you guys, I just, I don't feel like reading my Bible. It's so hard. Christianity is hard. I don't have time. See, I can use this. I know how to use shame because I went to seminary. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to do that. I just want to tell you that at some point in your life, there will be an idol that you will be called to bow down to. And my hope and my prayer is that you bow down to Christ alone that you give your allegiance to Christ alone and that you don't make up goofy christian -y things. We have enough issues of sin in the church. We don't have to go outside looking for it. It's not our job to point and condemn those who are doing wrong all around us. God is the condemner of all sin against him and the mercy giver of all those who come to him by faith. God calls us to share good news. The good news in this story is that in front of the idol of Nebuchadnezzar, the golden statue, the furnace, the only person worthy of actual worship was in the fire. I mean, the gospel picture is so clear here. Jesus went in the fire so that we don't have to burn forever. And I know that hell is a Hell is a hard concept for some to believe in. I've been watching uh, this, this one guy just battle with his faith. And he says, well, I just, I don't know if I believe in hell. It's, it just seems so harsh. I can't understand how a loving God would send people to burn. Because if you read this story and you have any connection of religiosity, you're thinking, there's a king who said, bow down to me, or you burn in hell, or burn in a furnace. There's a creator who said, bow down to me, or you burn in hell. And you should be thinking, that seems odd. Now here's the difference, is that God is benevolent and that he has given thousands upon thousands of years for people to repent, to say, I've been following myself. I've been following someone else. I haven't been following you, God. And hell, I, I, I just want to break this to you. If you think that fire and gnashing of teeth are the bad part of hell, they are not the bad part of hell. Not by a, a wide margin. So next time you burn yourself and you say, ow, that hurts like hell, no, you don't even know. Because it's not the pain. The physical pain is not the, the scariest part of hell. The more you study the Bible and understand who God is, benevolent, loving, kind, good, the more you understand that, that sunshine, beaches, beautiful paintings, sunsets, that perfect bite of food, these are gifts from a good and loving God. See, hell is the absence of anything that is of God's goodness and grace and kindness. 
There is no more beauty in hell. There is no more tasting wonderful things in hell. The fire is so secondary because what is going on in hell is that there is no God. There is no source of life, fountain of living water. And the saddest part is that God in his infiniteness that I cannot fathom does this to us. Romans 1 says he shows us in creation, his and through his invisible attributes, you see his power and his glory in the stars, in creation, in science, in biology. And what we do is we ignore it. And we say, no, God, I'm going to find my own way. And God says, fine, I'll, I'll let you go. And hell is when we keep telling God, I don't want to go your way. I want to go my way. I don't want to go your way. I want to go my way. I don't want to go your way, God. I'm going to go my way. Hell is the eventual end where God finally says, your whole life you've wanted to go your own way, so I'm going to let you go your own way that is without me, and you're going to see what life without me truly looks like. It is hell. You see, the place, the lake of fire, wasn't created for me and for you. Revelation is very clear. It was created for Lucifer and the other fallen angels. We go there because we choose to follow their images instead of God's image. And God says, I want, I'm here. Come to me. Come to me. Receive me. I'm here. And we're here to say there's good news, you guys. There's room at the cross. We're not all a bunch of crazy religious people who scream politics. Like, there's room. Jesus loved you. Sent his son to die for you. There's room. Believe. Repent. Repent and believe. Repent doesn't mean just turn around. Repent means stop looking at this idol and look at Jesus. Have a change of God, not just a change of mind, not just a change of behavior. Change the God that you serve, the person that you wake up for, the person that you think about when you go to sleep at night. I love Naomi's just like, uh, just so innocent. Like, hi, I'm Naomi Shea. Pastor Ryan uh, told me to tell you why I love to worship. Because you see her every week, and I'm like, man, people see Naomi sing so often, but probably don't even know that she loves singing to Jesus. Like, I'll bet you sing to Jesus when you're by yourself sometimes. Do you? When you're doing your Spanish, de gloria en gloria te veo, cuanto más te conozco, quiero saber más de ti. That's not Spanish. I made that language up. <laughs> it's pretty good, though, huh? I speak in tongues now. Let's go. Just kidding. That was actual Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, find the God that will come with you and walk through the fire with you walked through the fire for you, overcame sin and death on your behalf so that you never have to go through those things for eternity. You and I will go through these things here in this life. Some of it will be self-inflicted stupidity. Some will be governing authorities, crushing down and trying to take religion. Doesn't matter. Walk faithfully before God. Don't bow down to an idol. Bow to Christ and Christ alone. And if he comes into the midst of your fire and saves you, yay. And if he doesn't, and you finally get to die of something, yay, gain is what Paul calls it. To live is Christ, to die is gain. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, we're not going to bow because God will save us. But just in case he doesn't, just know we still won't bow. May we be this enthralled with the Jesus who walks through the fire on our behalf to never bow down when the world tries to engulf us in its lies and idols starting in the ones that are coming out of our phones and our TVs and our albums and our movies and our culture. Pray with me.